Christmas with the Romanovs was surprisingly domestic aside from the added duties that the festive season brought. The children's nanny, Margreta Aega, recalled in her memoirs how the Tsarina Alexandra decorated the Christmas trees throughout the palace herself, and how the young children, all under the age of 10 at her time of employment, thoroughly enjoyed the festivities. The children and I had a tree for ourselves. It was fixed into a musical box which played the German Christmas hymn and turned round and round. It was indeed a glittering object. All the presents were laid out on white covered tables and the tree stood for several days, an object of intense interest and admiration of the children. On New Year's Day, there was a great ceremony in the palace cathedral. The emperor and empress and the dowager empress went to church in state, accompanied by their own courts and all the grand ducal courts, all wearing full court dress. We saw the empress when she was dressed. Very magnificent she looked in her court dress of white satin and its long train of brocade seven chains of diamonds round her neck, a girdle of the same sparkling gems round her waist, the ends falling to the hem of her dress. On her head she wore the kokoshnik, the crescent-shaped headdress, in white brocade, lavishly decorated with large single stone diamonds. A rich lace veil depended from it and hung at the back almost to her knees. The little girlies were delighted to see her so gorgeously attired. They circled round her in speechless admiration for some time, and suddenly the Grand Duchess Olga clapped her hands and exclaimed fervently, Oh, Mama, you are just like a lovely Christmas tree. Olga Alexandrovna, who was the last Tsar's sister, remembered Christmas slightly differently. It was more formal in the time of Alexander III. We felt we could eat nothing, such was our excitement, and oh, how difficult it was to keep silent. We all, even Nicky, by then a young man in his early twenties, lived for the moment when the unwanted dessert cleared away, the parents would get up and go into the banqueting hall. But the children and all the others must wait until the emperor rang a handbell. Then all etiquette, let alone formality, was thrown to the winds, and there was a stampede towards the doors of the banqueting hall. Once those were flung open, they found themselves in a magic kingdom, Christmas trees each glimmering with multicoloured candles and glittering with gilded and silver fruit and ornaments seemed to fill the hall. Handmade Christmas presents were crafted by the Tsarina and all of the children, and they were given to all of the members of staff and the court, from ladies-in-waiting to maids and tutors. Traditionally, the gifts from imperial children to their parents were handmade. The children like to write out poems, typically in English, to give their parents as Christmas presents, and also drew and wrote letters and postcards to their international relatives. In the centuries before the last Royal Romano family, the royal children could expect much more decadent gifts. In 1843, Olga Nikolaevna, the daughter of Nicholas I, and Nicholas II, they're both called the same name, but they're very different. <laughs> In 1843, Olga wrote that she received a beautiful worth piano, paintings, elegant dresses, and from my papa, a bracelet with a sapphire, his favourite precious stone. However, looping back to the 1900s, Nicholas and Alexandra typically chose more modest gifts, such as handmade items and diaries for the year ahead, much more practical rather than lavish. The Tsar and Tsarina appear to have favoured giving the gift of books to their children. Many of these still survive with the original inscriptions on the inside of the cover. They typically show who the book was addressed to, the year it was given, and a note such as from your loving mama and papa. More elaborate, lavish and luxurious gifts and more expensive gifts were given around Easter time, which was traditionally a more significant date in the Orthodox calendar. It is, of course, from these Easter gifts that we get the famous Fabergé eggs. Interestingly, these eggs are actually a really helpful source to getting to know the Grand Duchess's appearance better, because there were so many little miniatures of them shown on the eggs from 1895 when Olga was born, the eldest, to around 1916 when the last eggs were made. These little miniatures show the complexion of the Grand Duchesses, their hair, their eye colour, and they are very helpful at bringing some colour back to life. During World War I, gift giving was extended to patients that the family met in their local infirmaries, and in the case of Alexandra, Olga and Tatiana, officers that they helped nurse back to health at the Sarskoy Silo Infirmary. Christmas parties giving at the hospitals and infirmaries seem to have been a particular source of joy for the children. These parties brought festive cheer to troubled times. They included great merriment, such as gift giving, singing and dancing, and the Grand Duchesses wrote about them very fondly in their diaries. 
On Christmas Day in 1916, Olga wrote in her diary that at two o'clock everyone went to the arena for the convoy's Christmas party. All the dear ones were there. Looking at them is so soothing. At six, we two, meaning Olga and Tatiana, with Mama to our infirmary, a Christmas tree was set up in the drawing room. Mama gave out gifts to all. There were also annual Christmas parties at the Nanny School, which was a local orphanage near the palace. The children frequently visited the Nanny School and made lots of friends with the children there. Testament to how much the Grand Duchesses love children, Tatiana wrote in her diary on the 26th of December 1914 that at three o'clock went to the Nanny School for the Christmas party. Squeezed the children. <laughs> there were also more private Christmas parties given by the Romano family. If we turn once again to Tatiana's diary, this time in 1915, she writes that at three o'clock there was a Christmas party for everyone, then for the ladies. At 5.30, went to meet Papa. Awfully glad that he is back. Had our party upstairs, received a lot of good things. Christmas celebrations were still carried out when the Romanovs were moved to Tobolsk, which I imagine was considerably more snowy and cold than in the Alexander Palace. Olga wrote a letter to her friend Rita Kotrovo, who she nicknamed Ritka. Hello, my dear Ritka. Well, the holidays are upon us already. We have a Christmas tree in the corner of the hall and it dispenses a wonderful scent, but not at all the same as in Sarskoy Silo. This is some special kind of tree called balsam. It smells strongly of oranges and tangerines, and there is resin flowing down the trunk constantly. There are no ornaments, but only silver streams and wax candles, of course from the church, since there are no others. The Grand Duchesses still made handmade gifts for their friends and for their retainers who were living with them in Tobolsk. Tatiana was especially adept at crochet, though all of the girls took part in things such as needlework, crochet and knitting, these typically comprise some of the handmade gifts. I turned my hand to crochet this year uh, and actually made a crochet present for my friend and let's just say that it's probably not as good as what Tatiana could have done. <laughs> Pages from the Tsarina's private photograph album show pictures of the four Grand Duchesses beside a Christmas tree. They were then aged between 10 and 4. Another show the baby Sorovich Alexei being held up in front of the Christmas tree. Photographs of the snow building up outside, diary entries talking about going ice skating, and memoirs from those who knew them saying that the children just loved the excitement and the sparkliness of Christmas, just as any other child would, are a wonderful insight into how, even though these children of course had immense luxury and privilege in their lives compared to the rest of children in Russia, there was something really quite pure about Christmas. Like any other child in the world, they had one thing on their mind, being excited for Christmas Day. That brings us to the end. It was a quicker video today, but I wanted to get something out before Christmas and the New Year, so here we are. You may have noticed that I have moved a little bit. Um, I have some of my favourite books here and photographs, and um, yeah, I thought it was a bit more fitting having a little history corner where I can squirrel away with research rather than sitting in front of a blank background. <laughs> I also have this big poster which is my favourite and that little print of a postcard because I'm too scared to put real postcards in a frame in case it falls because knowing me I've assembled them wrong. <laughs> As always, all of these sources will be at the end of the video and in the description if you want to do more research. And all that there is left for me to say is thank you so very much for watching and take good care of yourselves and Merry Christmas.